Greetings and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens, editor at large of The Hill. Thank you for joining us for the final session of our Diversity and Inclusion Summit. We've been testing the proposition that without diversity, a government doesn't really f represent its constituents, its society suffers, and businesses and organizations are far less successful. As we wrap up this event, we're gonna take a look at how all of us can play a role in building a culture of equity in society. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Qualcomm, the International Franchise Association, and the National Association of Realtors for their support of today's program. And special thanks to the National Association of Realtors for supporting this particular band of programming, and it's gonna be a great, great band. Stay tuned, lots of cool stuff, particularly my next speaker. Some of the leading minds in civil rights and social activism are with us this afternoon to discuss how intentional actions can lead to positive and constructive change. But before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at the Hill events, and you can use the hashtag, hashtag the Hill diversity. We're broadcasting live. We'll be taking your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, just refresh the page. Hopefully that will fix it. Our first guest is a proud 35th generation New Mexican. That's the coolest Way to frame it, I just love that. Uh, Representative Deb Halan serves New Mexico's first congressional district and is one of the first Native American women serving in Congress. She is co-chair of the Native American Caucus and vice chair of the Equality Caucus, and we may be seeing her in a Biden administration soon. I don't want to jinx it, but I hope you'll come back and talk to me no matter where you sit uh, in government. <laughs> Representative Halan, it's great to talk to you again. Let me just ask you, we've been talking about diversity and inclusion, and I want to make sure that we don't have any blind spots as, as we think about this issue. And you, you uh, talk about diversity broadly, but you also um, are very worried about um, the Native American community, the indigenous community in America, really being left out of these conversations. So how do you see it? Absolutely. Well, uh, we need more voices. Uh, we need diversity across the board, right? And and that's why I'm super proud to be one of the first Native women in Congress alongside my dear friend and colleague, Sharice Davids. Uh, we need people speaking for their own communities so that we get that perspective at the table. So that's absolutely important, yes. You've been pushing some legislation as building blocks of this. I'm, you know, and I love the name, the Not Invisible Act. Uh, the Native American Business Incubators Program Act, the Progress for Indian Tribes Act. Tell us what these building blocks do. And secondly, who are the villains st trying to stop them? So let me just say that um, Indian country, I mean, look, we've been, uh, we have been uh, working to overcome so many of the federal governmental policies through the years. Um, the boarding schools, uh, res the reservation systems, the Dawes Act. I mean, these are all things that essentially um, did not allow Native Americans to live their lives, right? And so the Not Invisible Act, uh, that is addressing uh, the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women. This isn't an issue that's been happening just the last couple of generations. It's been happening since the Europeans came to this continent to begin colonizing um, the Native Americans who were here. And so um, when we start chipping away at these issues that have been happening for a long time, for example, um, uh, the Not Invisible Act of 2019, it will, have, it will start a commission that will study this crisis and make sure that we know how to, do, how to move forward with it, how to keep our Native women safe from this, from this crisis. And uh, that's just the beginning though, right? When you have an issue, a crisis that's been manifesting itself for 500 years, uh, it's gonna take more than one or two pieces of legislation to remedy. So, um, so that's what we'll begin working on. You know, Representative Holland, I you know, usually don't go into my own story, but, but um, in the mid 1990s, I was a senior policy advisor to Senator Jeff Bingaman. And I was in New Mexico all the time, very frequently visit around, visited schools on, uh, you know, Native American schools. And, and um, let's just say that my, my concerns back then, over 25 years ago, about structural neglect and the impact mm -hmm. that it makes on the psyche of children and families, the health challenges that, that were existing, now, I haven't, I haven't made a lot of those trips, you know, you know at, the, at the same frequency since, but it horrified me. 
I guess my question to you is, is that improving or is that structural neglect still as palpable as it was back then when I when I experienced it? Well, I think I think we're improving in some ways, but in some ways we're not. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, you know, this pandemic, it's hit communities of color, uh, especially hard in Indian country are some of those communities that have been hit hard by the pandemic. Um, there are, you know, there are Indian communities with no running water, with no electricity, no opportunities for telehealth. Uh, their water is polluted. I mean, there's all of these challenges that, that communities of color face and native communities are absolutely some of those communities that are the most hardest hit. In New Mexico, uh, it, we're about 11% of the population and at one time over 50% of the positive COVID cases. So uh, there are disparities that are being suffered by so many communities, Indian country in particular, and so, um, so yes, it, we need to keep we need to keep working hard. And I think um, this year, uh, looking at the political side, more Native Americans running for public office than ever before, not just for Congress, but for state legislatures and county commissions and and other offices. I think that's absolutely going to help make sure that our voices are heard on every level. And that's what needs to happen. We need representation um, at the table where decisions are being made so that people have a voice. Do you think the incoming B uh, Biden administration has that well set in place? And I know you're being considered for a cabinet level position, but but I don't know how to frame it. I'm just going to be be honest. You know, sometimes you bring in people because of the identities they represent. That doesn't necessarily mean they get it. Do they get it? You know, we, we were talking about Operation Warp Speed earlier. And if there does become a safe, efficacious vaccine that people can you know, eventually trust, they're still going to have communities out there that don't see themselves talking about the v vaccine. They don't see a trusted ambassador. So in your conversations with the Biden administration about COVID, about this community, do, do, you, do you get the sense that their commitment is structural and real? Absolutely. Uh, by, uh, President-elect Biden has a tremendous, tremendous uh, policy platform for Indian country. Uh, the, 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 one of the strongest pillars of his platform is tribal consultation. And I trust by, uh, President-elect Biden to make sure that he is bringing tribal leaders to the table for those um, important decisions. He is not going to make decisions that affect Indian country without talking to them first. And that will be a breath of fresh air compared to what this current administration has done, uh, blasting apart sacred sites, for example, to build a Southern border wall uh, and te texting the tribal leader, you know, two hours ahead of uh, the time that uh, dynamite is, is being Im implanted in the ground. Um, so the, the Biden, ad a Biden administration will absolutely have the best interests of Indian country at heart and the best interests of communities of color at heart. Um, I have every uh, bit of faith in, in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to ensure uh, that they are bringing those voices to the table. And um, I'm actually looking very forward to it. One last thing. Uh, President-elect Biden has promised to, to re-implement the tribal nation summits every year. Uh, that's where he brings Indian tribes to uh, Washington, D.C. to make sure that he is talking directly to tribes. So, um, so I look forward to us having a voice in this administration, and I think it's very heartfelt. I think it's very real. Deb, just in, in the uh, last question, you just want to squeeze when we're in. 73 million folks voted for President Trump. What, you, you work in Congress. You work cross aisles. New Mexico is a crazy place. There's every dimension of politics there. How do you talk to people? How do you bring them over to get empathy, to get understanding, to break some of this gridlock? Well, of course, I, I'd like to say that um, you start with things that you can agree on. And um, Indian country, you know, those are some issues that some of us can agree on. And in fact, um, I am I am I was the high, highest rated freshman for bipartisanship. Most of my bills 
had co-sponsorships from across the aisle. And I've worked with my Republican colleagues to move our country forward in a lot of areas. So um, we can absolutely agree on things. We're all humans, right? We, uh, we can agree on things. We need to find those things and we need to push, start with those things and push them forward. And I have every uh, faith that we can do that. Well, Representative Deb Holland of the great state of New Mexico, uh, co-chair of the Native American Caucus, vice chair of the Quality Caucus, lots of other stuff that she's got out there. Maybe, who knows, the next Secretary of Interior. Really, really appreciate your time and thoughtful. I hope you'll come back and talk to us soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Reverend William J. Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and pastor of the Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Drawing on the unfinished work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People's Campaign, which called for a revolution of values, Repairs of the Breach works with hundreds of partners nationwide to advocate for communities of color, immigrants, the poor, women, the LGBTQ community, children, workers, and the sick. It's a big, big uh, lift of this organization. Reverend Barber, I'm so grateful for you joining us today. Listen, I... Uh, admire so much what needles you're trying to move in our society where structural racism has been part of the fabric of this nation. People don't like to, to talk about that to some degree, but we are now. And so as a new presidential administration is coming in, I just want to ask you, what marks do they need to hit and what would disappoint you uh, with this new administration coming in if they don't get it right? Well, thank you so much for having me. I think, first of all, we have to align a part of systemic racism and systemic poverty. Then when we talk about racism, we have to talk about it in all of its dynamics. Uh, black people, but not just police brutality, that uh, resegregation of public schools, disparities in health care and economics, um, in mass incarceration. We have to talk about racism and how it how we treat and do not still do not have just immigration policies uh, for particularly our Latino brothers and sisters. And we have to talk about the continued mistreatment and refusal to fully uh, treat uh, our indigenous brothers and sisters right. But we also have to deal with the fact that we have before COVID 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 43 percent of the nation and 60.9 uh, percent of black people are poor and low wealth, 26 million people. But we also have 66 million white people who are poor and low wealth. That's 31% of, of white people. So we have to, first of all, talk about race and poverty together. We have to deal with the 62 million people who work every day for, uh, without a living wage. We have to deal with the fact that over 50% of black people work every day without a living wage. And if those are, and those being the facts, then there are some things we have to make sure. This president, this president elect ran on three critical things that have to happen in the first hundred days. He ran on 15 and a union, openly 15 and a union. If we pass $15 minimum wage, 49 million people will be lifted out of poverty and that will have a powerful impact in the African-American community. He ran on expanding health care, and we know health disparity is a critical issue, particularly in COVID, among poor people who are dying at a larger rate and black people, but many of the black people that are dying at a larger rate are poor and low wealth. So we have to have health care expansion. And they ran on dealing with systemic racism. And so the issue of of passing the Voting Rights Act and restoring it and expanding voting rights and pa and dealing with um, police reform and and dealing with more full funding of public education. Uh, those things are critical, making sure that we have a just immigration policy, making sure that our indigenous families, our nations are treated properly in policy and are protected on their federal lands. Those are the kinds of things that must happen um, right off the bat early in the administration because people did not vote for normal. They voted for change. So, you know, I'm interested, you know, when you talk about the, the, the parts of society that are right now, they've been looked down on, they've been demeaned, they've been pu gut punched uh, in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And so when you kind of look at that broad array of people you're trying to lift up, I mean, it's, it's, it's inspiring one to hear such an inclusive statement. 
But the other dimension is who are the villains that need to be taken down that are trying to prevent the progress and really the empowerment of, of that part of our equation in the country? Well, first of all, let's look at the policies that are villainous, and that is the uh, 2017 tax reform law that gave to the greedy and the wealthy, um, but disproportionately hurt poor uh, communities and black and brown communities by creating situations that force more money to be cut from education. Let's look at the fact that we have a bloated military budget where we spend 54 cents of every discretionary dollar on the war economy, what a Republican Eisenhower called the congressional uh, uh, military industrial complex and less than 16 cents of every discretionary dollar on infrastructure and health care and wages. If we just took a portion of that money and directed it toward infrastructure, toward health care, toward public education, we could fundamentally shift the lives of poor and low wealth people. And that would in a major, major way shift the lives of black people and brown people and indigenous people. And by the way, it would impact poor whites as well, which is something we have to talk about that racism is not just, it's against black and brown people, but it's all and indigenous people, but it actually is anti-democracy. And then lastly, we have to look at the Senate. Uh, Mitch McConnell has called himself the Grim Reaper. You know, some people say Trump is the criminal, but Mitch McConnell is the getaway car driver. And he has d deliberately not even allowed bills on living wage to come to the floor, uh, expanding health care to come to the floor. He has refused for over... 2,700 days since for over seven e uh, years since 2013 to fix the Voting Rights Act uh, and expand voting rights. We have to stop this. We cannot allow that because not even having a debate on these things is contrary to uh, uh, what we call ourselves as democracy. And let me make a connection here. Everybody in this country that we traced, I come from a state that had massive voter uh, suppression toward black and brown people. In fact, the courts, all the way up to the federal court said it was racism with surgical intent. But here's the connection. <clears throat> Those who benefit from racist voter suppression and end up getting office in office like Mitch McConnell, like Lindsey Graham, like uh, Tom Tillis in North Carolina, once they get in office, they vote to block health care, they vote to block living wages, and their votes actually end up hurting more white people in raw numbers than black people. It hurts more black people percentage-wise, but more white people in raw numbers. This is the ugly truth we must deal with about systemic racism that is targeted at black and brown people and indigenous people, but it ends up hurting all people, especially poor and low-income whites, and it, it is against the democracy, which is why in our campaign, we say the only way you can really deal with diversity and racism is you have to bring black, white, brown, Asian, uh, and Latino people together around an agenda to address systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white Christian evangelicalism. Thank you. That this is so powerful. You know, one of the things I was doing was kicking around on your, your website on uh, repairers of the breach, and I like the framing that some issues are not left versus right, but right versus wrong. I know you're bringing back Moral Mondays and gathering you know, people to go to talk about COVID, talk about the crisis, go talk to legislatures and, you know, uh, around the nation. I guess my question to you is, in this framing, do you find you have unexpected allies? Do you find that there are people, not just Democrat, Republican, but they get the message you're saying? Is that an opportunity that our listeners today ought to be aware of? that we need to be careful of typecasting people by political party. But when you put it in right versus wrong, there are more opportunities there than we may see. You're exactly right. I think the language of left and right and centrist is too puny for the moment we're in. In fact, the left and right language comes from the French Revolution. So I don't know why we're still using it in the 21st century. And I don't know what a centrist is. All, what I know, what we believe, is that what policy and politicians should be doing is dealing with what's at the center of people's lives. What's causing them misery? What's causing them pain? I said to President-elect Biden, the hope is in the morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. If you address the morning and the misery that people are going through, that's what heals the nation. You're going to heal the soul of the nation. You have to heal the body of the nation. You have to speak to the issues that people are dealing with. And now 62% of Republicans want expanded health care. 
Over two thirds of the country want an expanded minimum wage. So what needs to happen is a breaking from left and right and Republican and Democrat and centrist and conservative. Why not have constitutional politics? Why not start with our basic moral framework in the Constitution that says the first goal that you swear to uphold is to establish justice and recognize that establishing justice comes before ensuring domestic tranquility. And the bookend of that is, is, is the promoting the general welfare. Why not take every piece of policy, lay, a, lay those four principles, establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare, and then add equal protection under the law as the grid by which you will say whether this is good policy or bad policy. People are ready for that. So much so that yes, we organize people in Appalachia and in Alabama. We've brought together white farmers and black fast food workers. My co-chair and I, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, we've seen poor black and white Republicans and Democrats, gay and straight, come around around what we call these five interlocking injustices, saying they must change. That systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, that war economy, and the false moral narrative religious nationalism. We had a gathering in June 20th of this year called Poor People, Mass Poor People's Assembly Moral March on Washington. We didn't come to Washington because of COVID, but over 2.7, nearly 3 million people showed up online. In this past election, we contacted 3.1 million people peer to peer, un, uh, um, unfre infrequent poor and low wealth voters. Over 25% of them decided to vote early. 55% of poor and low wealth people, regardless of race, creed, or color, voted for the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, we saw 6 million more uh, poor and low wealth people come into the electorate this time. Now, that still means 28 million didn't vote, but really that's the only place to expand the electorate. And if we're going to change the South and change the country, one third of all poor people live in the South, one third of all poor white people live in the South, we now did a study called Voting is Power Unleashing. We found out in 15 states, including North Carolina, Texas, Georgia, Florida, if we get less than 19%, in most of those states, less than 12%, and some of them less than 5% of poor and low wealth voters to vote that didn't vote in 2016, they could fundamentally shift the elections in Senate races and in presidential elections. This is the place we must be our allies. And yes, it's happening all over the country. It's happening with the Poor People's Campaign. And if Biden and Harris will maintain and not listen to people saying you need to move away from what you ran on, that would be a mistake. If they move away from health care. They move away from $15 on a union. They need to and move away from dealing with systemic racism and follow this, this, um, this strange notion of, of, of being a centrist. I don't even know what that is. What they need to focus on is what's in the center of the Constitution and what's in the center of people's lives, what's hurting people. And if you heal the body of people, if you speak to their pain, that will unify people. That will show them that they need to leave the division alone and they need to come to a place where there is vision to deal with their misery and mourning. That's where the hope is. Face the people's problems and pain. Like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, know that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Focus on the people's pain and lift them out of the pain, especially in the middle of COVID. And that's where we will see healing of this nation. Well, Dr. William J. Barber II, um, president of Repairers of the Breach, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. I'm so grateful to you for bringing this set of views because you know, your perspective is so compelling, but I have to say it's one that I know a lot of our viewers may not get every day, and I'm very grateful for you to bring that um, perspective uh, into this discussion on making diversity and inclusion uh, much more real in this country. So thank you so much. Thank you. Forward together is what we say, and not one step back. Take care now. Mark Morial is the president and CEO of the National Urban League. Over the last 15 years, Mark's expanded the services of the Urban League to create policies that serve communities of color. He's also the former mayor of one of my favorite cities, New Orleans. Uh, Mark, great to see you. Let me just hey, open thanks this. for having you, me. You, you know, when I was a you know, young lad running around Los Angeles um, uh, at the beginning of my career, uh, I knew a guy named John Mack, and he was executive director of the Urban League out there. I don't know if you knew John, but he was like a giant, and he was... 
he was in this, and he taught me, you know, in the, in the programs we were doing way back when, he said, you know, our, our people, the people we're working with are powerful and they don't know it. You've got, you've got to build the network, you've got to build businesses, you've got to build different dimensions, and, and it's going to take time. There are no silver bullets. I had a huge amount of respect for John Mack. I know you head the Urban League nationally, and I guess I'd ask you, you know, when you look at your dashboard of the, of, of the priorities you have to continue to basically rectify structural injustice over a long period of time, I know there are no silver bullets, but what are the things you put in a line to begin uh, changing, changing the day, if you will? Well, first of all, let me thank you for having me. And John Mack, the late John Mack, uh, was a mentor, a friend, uh, a member of the National Urban League Board of Trustees uh, uh, on my, uh, during my time. And, and the man was enormously uh, talented, a great leader, a passionate uh, fighter for civil civil rights and social justice and economic empowerment. So we we think we like to think at the National Urban League through the lens of economic empowerment, mm. and that means that central to our work uh, is the racial wealth gap and the racial income and economic divide that exists in this country. It's significant uh, on the wealth side. It's ten to one. Uh, on the income and earnings side, the average black family uh, brings in about $40,000 a year. The average white family, it's nearly $75,000 a year. The black unemployment rate is historically twice what the white unemployment rate is. Uh, and, and those are the economic realities that have been frozen in suspended animation now for, for almost 50 years. And that's the lens through which we look at. So the question when it comes to that is, will policies eradicate, erase, narrow these gaps? Uh, in this environment, this new environment, this racial justice environment, uh, with this new Biden administration, it is crucial uh, that economic policies be intentional uh, in their design and in their impact uh, on closing the income divide, closing the racial wealth divide, uh, and, and, and addressing the long-standing fundamental issue is that black people, when it comes to the economy of America, are like a caboose on the train. If the train speeds up, the black community may speed up, but it's still in the caboose position on the train. And it's through that lens that we look at the programs we run, we operate, we design. It's through that lens that we look at the policies uh, that we champion. And the thought leadership we provide. Mark, a lot of the people that we've had on today, we've had, we, we've got a, a guy coming on shortly, Thomas Mitchell, very interesting guy talking about asset building. We had um, a franchise person on earlier talking about wealth building and how she was building this out of, you know, elder care uh, facilities and what she was doing. We have, you know, one of our other um, supporters of today is looking at the legacy of redlining, you know, which is, you know, harm communities. You go in these communities and sort of look at at, at the real estate world, right? Essentially, real estate is how most middle-class Americans over the years put together their so-called nest egg, put together assets and building. I guess my question to you is, are there opportunities to, to I don't know how to say it, leapfrog, to, to change the asset game, to get people in uh, and, and, you know, when I talked to the woman from the French, you know, who, who set up her franchise, she said, you know, the bank wouldn't give her a loan. She found other ways to do it. So I'm just interested as you kind of look at that when it comes to capital, it comes to investment, it gives people a start. And, you know, not everybody succeeds. They fail. And guess what happens if you fail in Silicon Valley? You get another chance. So I guess my question is, is so any of that changing? Let me talk to you about a combination of the problems and the solutions. So fundamental to asset building is earnings. Right. and income, and the ability to bring in enough money to not only take care of the basic needs of life, but to also save or to also invest in a down payment on a home. So you can't separate or divorce earnings, things like a $15 minimum wage tied to, in, tied to inflation uh, that brings the large number of black people, some maybe 40%, uh, who are low wage workers up uh, to a living wage level from home ownership, from asset building, or from business formation. 
That is number one. Number two, I think what we've learned over the last 50 years, and particularly in the last 20 years, as we've lost ground, particularly since the Great Recession, the black home ownership rate has depressed from nearly 50% down to where it's just hovering above 40%, where it was uh, in 1968, the year the Fair Housing Act was passed. Uh, it's going to take, in the new Biden administration and the new Congress, intentional efforts to create, if you will, mortgage opportunities for black communities and brown communities to get the home ownership rate up. So you've got to address uh, the credit scoring system, uh, which uh, has biases built into it. You have to provide down payment assistance and second mortgages. You have to initiate through an infrastructure program uh, uh, a plan to build new units of both affordable rental and affordable homes for ownership. And you've got to address this loan denial rate, this disparity in terms of how banks and others provide capital by not just fixing the loan side of the capital formation equation, but what I call the venture and risk side, the equity side of the capital formation uh, the capital formation equation. So are there things that can be done? I have some hope that this new Biden administration uh, is going to recognize as a president-elect has lifted up racial justice, the need uh, to do things differently when it comes to economic policy. Can we leapfrog? Can we jump? I am certain we can make progress, but it cannot be business as usual. And these policies are going to have to step away from race-neutral thoughts to more specificity around how these programs are designed in order to address this. And this is what we're going to be championing. And I, I tell people, look, if we want to solve the problem, let's solve the problem. If we're dealing with 21st century issues, let's not be constrained to use 20th century solutions. Mark, is the Biden administration talking to you at a high level? Yes, I'm very excited that Cedric Richmond, uh, who, of course, I've known from New Orleans and uh, who I've worked with for many, many years, will be taking a senior role. Uh, and, and we've had some discussions with uh, various members of the team. We're looking forward to uh, a discussion with the president-elect, the vice president-elect, uh, and the highest uh, levels of his of his of his uh, of his team. Here's what's important. Number one, that the commitment to a diverse cabinet, a diverse White House staff, and diverse appointees is carried through. We need to see historic diversity. African American voters played an important role in the president elect's coalition. Let me point out a few things in Milwaukee, Detroit. Philadelphia and Atlanta alone, the number of voters who voted in 2020 compared to 2016 was an additional quarter of a million votes. Many of those were African-American voters. But for those voters, the president-elect would not have carried Wisconsin, nor Michigan, nor Pennsylvania, nor Georgia. Uh, and I've heard all these pundits with their spin what they are not recognizing is that that turnout differential in those communities made the difference in these swing states. There were many other factors that went along, but I would say that that was the decisive factor in providing uh, an important win for the president-elect. So we want to see a diverse, uh, if you will, cabinet, White House, people connected to the community. Number two, uh, when it comes to racial justice, uh, we want to see some important early steps. Yes, a minimum wage increase. I think it's time for Congress to pass that. I think the, cha the president should champion it in his 100-day plan. A Voting Rights Act uh, advancement. Uh, an infrastructure plan that includes housing and community facilities. Built into it provisions to ensure African-American businesses and African-American workers and Latino businesses and Latino workers have an opportunity, a real opportunity to participate in the upside of such an investment. So we are looking for and then meaningful 
criminal justice reform. So we think the Joe Biden that I know is a person who takes his commitment seriously. Uh, and I think this is a moment like maybe 1932 or 1964, uh, where this country is poised, this country needs, it needs real action. It needs progressive pragmatism. Uh, it needs a legislative agenda that is meaningful and real. Let's be quite honest with everyone. The president elects coalition, which is urban and suburban and rural and black and white and Hispanic and Asian. The president elects coalition which is young and old. It's in the Northeast. He won a significant big state in the South. It's across the Sun Belt to Arizona and New Mexico and Nevada. It's in the Pacific Northwest. It's in the upper Midwest. Is one of the most, if you will, broadest coalitions assembled by any president who has in effect defeated an incumbent president in modern American history. And the popular vote, I think confers a mandate for progressive action, yes on COVID, yes on the economy, yes on racial justice. And we are looking forward to that. Well, Mark Moriel, President and CEO of the National Urban League, I really appreciate you coming and sharing these views with us. I hope you'll come back. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, we'll be back soon. Thank you. Thank you. More than half a century after the Fair Housing Act was implemented, racial discrimination is still preventing some Americans from achieving the cornerstone of the American dream. Our next two guests are experts in property rights and fair housing, respectively. Thomas W. Mitchell is a professor and co-director of the Program in Real Estate and Community Development Law at Texas A&M University. He's best known for his work. Well, I don't know if he's best known, but I guess the world knows him for his work on property rights on behalf of disadvantaged families. He recently received a genius grant and was named the 2020 MacArthur Fellow. Lisa Rice is president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. The organization advances fair housing principles principles and preserves and broadens fair housing protections to expand equal housing opportunities for undeserved, underserved Americans. Nice to see you both. Thomas, I, I'm, I'm fascinated, both of you, I'm fascinated by this question of how communities of color have been blocked for so long on the asset building, wealth building side of this. Uh, pre in my previous employment, Donna Hesey Coates, you know, wrote about redlining in district and you know how there had been just generations upon generations upon generations of systemic exclusion in communities. And so, and so Thomas, let me just start with you. Um, you wrote this uniform partition partition of heirs property act. My neighbors, my former neighbors in D.C were uh, a black family that had had this house for generations and generations and generations, 17 siblings. And what you describe, what you're trying to prevent, which I'm going to ask you to share, is something that happened to this family. They basically, a piece got lodged out and somebody came along and they, they were forced to sell this, this home that had been in, 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 in their family for years and years. So take us down this and tell us what the injustice of that is and what you've tried to do with it. Yeah, so I think of what I think of is the kind of the original sin at the end of the Civil War. African Americans, uh, unbeknownst to many people, actually acquired a fair amount of property in terms of agricultural land between the end of the Civil War in 1910. There was a you know significant somewhere between 16 and 20 million acres, but from the very beginning, the the property wasn't considered prime real estate, and these uh, new landowners um, essentially had no access to affordable legal services. There were hardly any black attorneys uh, in the country at that time, and white attorneys considered it bad for business to represent these this new class of black property owners. And as a result, they didn't do the type of things that property owners who have uh, uh, access to excellent legal services um, do. They hire lawyers to structure their ownership to make sure that there's continuity of ownership at time, the asset is protected, is protected against some type of forced uh, sale that will result in a fire sale stripping the family of wealth. And unfortunately, once you um, fall into this type of ownership, it's nearly impossible to extract, extricate yourself um, because it takes 100% of the family members to agree to a, a better form. So I think that you had, as a result, this most disfavored form of what in law we call common real property ownership, the most unstable form, heirs property, uh, the formal titles, tenancy and common property, that 
And under that structure, any one of the common owners, and when I say common owners, um, it's like owning shares in a corporation. Nobody in the ownership group owns any particular piece of the property. They own a fractional undivided interest in the entire property. But the law permits in this, unfortunately, this most disfavored form of common ownership that you get if you don't make a will, allows any one individual to go to court, uh, file this action called a partition action, and then request the court to order a forced sale of the entire property, even if everybody else in the ownership group wants to maintain ownership, even if the person who uh, sought the forced sale, if they own 1% interest, I mean, they don't have, they can own a one, one millionth percent interest as long as they've got some interest. And that process had been abused for decades by real estate speculators and developers who just preyed upon these families took their property, not only took their properties, the sales were these things that we call auction sales or share of sales, mm. which you're lucky if you get 50% of the market value of the property. So the families lost their property and then they were stripped of a substantial amount of the real estate wealth in the process. And for African-Americans and Latinos in particular, right. their asset portfolios consist disproportionately of their real estate or their real property holdings. And so it had a double whammy on those communities. I mean, I appreciate you sharing this and, you know, I don't jump to Lisa, but when, it, you know, when I, when I experienced this and I saw it, I, I honestly was outraged and, and very disheartened by the situation until I read about you. I didn't know uh, that in fact there was someone or a set of laws beginning to sort of look at how you begin protecting those. So I hope people are listening, because this is a serious issue, and if it happened next door to me, it's happening next door to a lot of other people. You know, Lisa, um, I guess I would ask you and put, you know, just make you the problem solver. You know, we've been talking a lot today about how communities of color, uh, in particular now, you know, in black housing, the, 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 the cards have been stacked against families and people for a very long time. Like, and, and, and even in the areas you work you know, uh, in so much, you know, I was, the Fair Housing Act packs you know, seven days after Martin Luther King you know, was assassinated. There was a, a moment there to try to rectify a lot of these things. We still have massive problems out there. So I guess my question to you is how do we begin seriously unstacking the deck? Okay, thank you again for inviting me to participate in this um, really important discussion. I, and I think I should provide um, a little bit of information as a backdrop. So first, since before the inception of the United States of America, most of our housing and finance policies were race-based hmm. and were specifically designed to provide opportunities for white Americans while simultaneously denying opportunities for uh, African Americans, Native Americans, and other people of color. The, the laws were race-based, right? Um, and so what happened is during the 1960s and 1970s when we passed the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, right? Uh, we, we said going forward, you cannot consider a person's race or gender or national origin when you are making a housing or finance decision, right? But what we did was we left in place the structures and the systems, the, the discriminatory systems, the systemically inherently unfair and racist systems. We left all of those in place. We left in place residential segregation, which is not a natural construct. It's not a natural byproduct of how consumers uh, act, right? Residential segregation was forced upon us by federal government policies, by state and local policies, uh, by industry actors. It's, a, it's an engineered construct. But when we passed the civil rights laws, we left residential segregation in place. Residential segregation is what helped facilitate the development of the dual credit market. We left the dual credit mm. market in place. So we passed the civil rights laws that sort of helped to address individual um, uh, discrimination, but we left systems of inequality and racism in place. And right. those systems are performing their job. They're doing what they were designed to do. 
residential segregation, we say all the time, is the bedrock of inequality. And residential segregation is still driving inequality today. That's why we're seeing the disparate outcomes from the COVID-19 crisis, right? Because they're, they're, they're systemically tied to place and they're systemically tied to the fact that uh, many communities of color do not have uh, opportunities, they don't have amenities and services. Uh, people of color disproportionately are living in health deserts, they're living in credit deserts, they're living in wealth deserts, they're living in water deserts, right? So these systems are just performing their function. You know, I, I, that was such an incredible articulation of the challenges of what have to be done. And, you know, and I've seen that, that it's not just housing, it's an ecosystem of neglect and of underinvestment and, you know, low opportunity. Um, let me ask you both, you know, Thomas, um, if you go first, when we have now a new administration coming in, well, they're going to come in, um, you know, when you look at HUD and the way HUD has been managed, I guess I have to ask this question, like, we're here today, like the, the, the combination of forces, of finances, of, of, of the issues that uh, Lisa just described has gotten, it, gotten us to this point. So I, I'm not naive to think that, you know, an administration can be able to, sh you know, shift all of this. But if you're going to basically front end some things that you think were really important in terms of changing what I would call the asset building, asset owning opportunities, you know, take what Lisa was just talking about, which was essentially these zones that are deserts. And and with, an, with a change in uh, 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 presidential administration, what would you front end uh, to, to make a shift in that? Lisa, I'd like to ask you exactly the same thing. Thomas? Yeah, so first of all, I do want to, since you were interested, you know, in, in my work, I was the principal drafter of this model state statute to address this abuse. Something I was given zero chance of success 20 years ago. We we're up to 17 states, including eight southern states. Um, in every region of the country, urban and rural, New York passed it because of abuses in New York City, where real estate speculators were preying upon black families. So we have that in place. There's uh, a federal farm bill that has provided some recent uh, assistance to farmers and ranchers who own this family, this air property. But I think that that could be built on. Right. So one of the things if you're looking at in terms of, for example, the USDA is you just cannot deny there has been decades and decades and decades of systemic um, discrimination, almost unrelenting. There's a reason the USDA is often referred to as the last plantation. So I, I think at a, at a macro level, right, that the that that type of systemic discrimination that you find uh, that that has permeated the USDA just has to be addressed. It's, there's a whole civil rights complaint process that has been broken for decades, it fundamentally needs to be repaired. And so you're getting, you're, without repairing that and addressing that head on, hmm. you're gonna see, continue to see cycles of discrimination. But let me tell you, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, three senators who have co-sponsored this, this bill that it will be, I think it will be filed at the end of this month, Mother Jones article. Uh, Mother Jones has an article out today and it's co-sponsored by Senator Booker, uh, Gillibrand and Warren called the uh, Justice for Black Farmers Act. And I think it's the most exciting bill because it fundamentally says we need to address the entire history of discrimination against black farmers and recognize that as a direct result of the federal government and the USDA discrimination, it drove huge numbers of black farmers out of the agricultural industry from constituting one in seven black farmers in 1910 to you know, a half a percent of, of farmers today. Um, and so, you know, if you want to look at the Mother Jones article, it, it um, highlights some of those key features of that bill, which would give land grants to black farmers. It would train uh, apprentices uh, to and give them the technical skills on their pathway to become farmers. Um, and I, I just think there's a, this is the most exciting bill I've seen in my lifetime. And I'll say the last thing is that in, in my work, there is a incredible lack of access to affordable legal services that has negatively impacted those who want to become uh, property owners who are uh, you know, people of color oh. and has um, undermined the ability of those who are property owners 
to maintain ownership of their property and to protect their wealth. And it's, it's a massive problem. And there's a role for the federal government. There's a role for state governments. There's a role for foundations. There's a role for law firms in terms of their kind of pro bono work. So I would really emphasize that need to fundamentally um, improve and upgrade and provide substantially more and, and robust legal services. Uh, Tom, it's not only am I going to go check out the Mother Jones article, I'm going to go see if Elizabeth Warren, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, and, and uh, Cory Booker want to come on and chat about that and, and maybe do something for the Hill. Um, but, but Lisa, let me ask you the same thing. What would you front load if you were talking to the administration saying, hey, here are the priorities to begin you know, coming in and, and, and undoing this? And, and I guess let me just add, you know, spice it up a little bit. What would be the wrong way to start? I, so, Steve, one of the things that we've been lifting up with the administration uh, is that they can just use the tools that are already at their disposal. One of the reasons we still have inequality in America is that the laws that are on the books now have not been effectively uh, enforced. Hmm. Uh, the Fair Housing Act does contain a provision for helping to address inequality. It's called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. It helps us to address the systemic issue called residential segregation. It's never been enforced, hasn't been enforced in over 50 years. Uh, and so we've been telling the new administration, why don't you just enforce the affirmatively furthering fair housing provision of the Fair Housing Act, uh, reestablish the president's Fair Housing Council, which was established under President Clinton and then disbanded. And then that elevates this issue of racial equality uh, to the, the, the level of the White House, it, it centers it at the White House and forces the White House to focus on this issue on a daily basis. So the thing to do wrong is to keep ignoring the tools that are already at the, expo the disposal of the federal government to uh, bring about racial equality. There's another tool embedded in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act called special purpose credit programs. Now, this is a tool that's been uh, available to us since uh, 1976 and we haven't used it. And so let's use tools like affirmatively furthering fair housing and the special purpose credit program in order to uh, address systemic residential segregation and to address uh, all of the challenges that we have because of the dual credit market. Well, thank you. I want to thank you both. This has been a fascinating conversation. I wish um, both of you well in, in trying to you know, move this, this, these challenges in a different direction. Thomas Mitchell, professor, co-director in real estate and community development law at Texas A&M. Uh, MacArthur Genius, uh, if I can say so. If they, is that still appropriate to call you MacArthur Genius? MacArthur Fellow, MacArthur Genius uh, Award, using resources to help on this area. And Lisa Rice, president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. I hope you'll come back. Fantastic comments, and uh, I know this is not going away overnight, so I hope we can continue this discussion with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now it's time for a message from our sponsor of this really phenomenal day. I don't know if you guys are having fun. I'm really learning a lot and, and, and loving this. But thank you to the sponsor who's going to share some thoughts with us from the National Association of Realtors. Hello, I'm Charlie Opler, 2021 President of the National Association of Realtors. Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion Summit sponsored by NAR and The Hill. In this segment, we're talking about how we can foster greater diversity in American life and society. And we can't do that without talking about fair housing. I'm joined by Brian Green, NAR's Director of Fair Housing Policy. Hello, Brian. Hi, Charlie. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks. We're talking about the fight for fair housing, where our country has been, where we're going, and where we are today. Understanding the history of discrimination in this country means we must understand the history of housing discrimination. America hasn't always lived up to its ideals. But many may not realize just how far-reaching this systemic housing discrimination was, particularly for African Americans. Brian, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Well, segregation in our country didn't happen by accident, and it wasn't uh, imposed on us uh, from without. Um, the government didn't just impose it on society. Um, this reflected practices, and unfortunately, uh, 
realtors were engaged in discriminatory practices. Uh, realtors were engaged in uh, the creation of racial covenants. And uh, the government ended up codifying many of these practices like redlining. Um, and then, of course, um, we all know blockbusting um, harmed communities. And so um, it's a tough history. Um, the, the realtors excluded uh, members based on race and, and sex. Uh, we opposed the passage of the Fair Housing Act. But we have uh, turned the corner, and now the realtors have emerged as leaders on these important issues. So uh, now we are talking about expanding uh, the Fair Housing Act uh, in ways we could not have imagined perhaps several decades ago. Brian, some people may think, didn't the passage of the Fair Housing Act actually solve these problems? Uh, well, unfortunately not. And unfortunately, this, this early history I described is a legacy that we still live with. Um, you know, our neighborhoods are still uh, very segregated, and you can see in our neighborhoods the imprints of redlining from um, 80 years ago. And of course, we know that many of these discriminatory practices denied the opportunities for families to pass on wealth. And uh, that's reflected in the home ownership gap that we see today, where we still have a 30, per 30 percentage point gap between African Americans uh, and white Americans. We see that white Americans own 10 times the wealth of African Americans. So these issues um, are serious and, and they have broader impacts on society than just housing. It, it means that we have uh, health disparities, employment disparities, educational disparities. So unfortunately, all of this is uh, the legacy of, of the past. And uh, at the very least, we know that uh, discrimination still occurs and we have to address it if we want to deal with these issues. Thank you, Brian. You know it was important to me that NAR hosts this forum. Because of our past mistakes, the real estate industry has a special role to play in this fight for fair housing. The tragic death of George Floyd and the national conversation on race that resulted has shifted the landscape for many Americans. In our industry, this shift brought a consensus that change starts with us. We must remember this history if we hope to repair today's racially divided communities and build a better future. Let me be clear. What realtors did was an outrage to our morals and our ideals. It was a betrayal of our commitment to fairness and equality. I'm here today as the president of the National Association of Realtors to say we were wrong. But we can't go back and fix our mistakes of the past. But we can look this problem squarely in the eye. And we can finally say on behalf of our industry that what realtors did was shameful and that we're sorry. I realize words are not enough. Actions are always louder than words. We must take positive action to remedy decades worth of inequality. Brian, NAR is fighting to expand fair housing on several fronts. Can you tell us about those? Yes, Charlie we have begun to act. And uh, that is the name of an initiative we have underway uh, called ACT uh, with an exclamation point. And it underscores um, our commitment to greater accountability, culture change, and better training. Uh, and accountability really is the key. Uh, we recognize we need to do more to self-test and correct issues when we see them. Um, we need to do the culture change that's necessary. We need to take a tough look at how uh, existing patterns reinforce each other. Uh, and of course, we need to improve the training that we provide our members. But beyond that, uh, we're working with partners. We're working with uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, to deal with economic inequality and uh, push for inclusion. So we have an initiative uh, that we're working on together. Uh, and we're also working with the National Association of Real Estate Brokers uh, to address minority home ownership and do what we can together uh, to create more opportunities. So uh, that work is underway and we'll be doing more partnerships. Brian, thanks for mentioning those partnerships. You know, it took many hands to create the inequality we see today 
and realtors can't solve it alone. But before we go, Brian, tell us what we can do to tell our listeners. How can they be part of the solution? Well, I think for starters, go to nar.realtor slash fair housing. Uh, and there you can find uh, some of the things that we are doing nationally. And you can explore how you can be a leader on those issues uh, in your state and locally. So uh, that's where I would start. Thanks again, Brian. That website was nar.realtor slash fair housing. That's where you'll find videos and articles, tools to overcome bias, resources for state and local associations, and much more. As leaders in our communities, realtors must be active participants in promoting equality, inclusion, and acceptance. It's the right thing to do, and it's long overdue. Well, that's our time. Please stay tuned as we wrap up the summit with some final thoughts and takeaways for you. Thanks for joining us. Wow, I just want to say a comment here. You know, I'm not, you know, we're not supposed to, I'm, I'm on the um, opinion side of our publication, but uh, to Charlie and to Brian, I just want to say it's very rare in this town uh, of, of Washington, D.C., in this world, just to be honest. I don't see people, you know, own uh, mistakes they've made that often uh, in such a clear and unambiguous way. So thank you. I hadn't seen this uh, before. Very powerful for me. But we're going to now move to another very powerful uh, part of this. Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz, known as Bush and Renz, they're a writer-director duo, and they're really cool and fascinating. They're driven by their passion for telling powerful stories of the disenfranchised, marginalized, underrepresented. They're going to haunt you. Uh, they were just named to the Out 100 list of top advocates for the LGBTQ plus community, my community. Annie Bellum, their first full-length feature film, Watch It and try and sleep, uh, released uh, back in August and has been getting a lot of attention. Let's take a quick look at a clip from the movie. Welcome, Bush and Reds. Franchisement of black people in America is by design written into the actual DNA of this country. Your argument, however flawed, has been successfully promoted and propagated through repetition. We hear it over and over again. But I'm here to tell you that this vicious cycle of inequity will soon be broken. Boom! 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 Boom. <laughs> Mommy, why was that man so angry? Oh, baby. That is a really great question. Sometimes what looks like anger is really just fear. Things are not always what they appear to be, baby. Well, this is, this is the beginning. I just want to say, you know, you can tell the story better than I have, but as I, you know, this is a successful author who finds herself trapped in a horrifying reality. You know, you present a strong black woman in modern society with this. What are you trying to convey in this through this fantastic horror film? Uh, well, first, you know, thank you for having us. Uh, it's an honor to be included in on this conversation that we think is really important that all of us should be having. Uh, for, for Christopher and I, what was really paramount in what we were creating with Antebellum was to recontextualize this country's original sin uh, in a way that we thought it would serve as the most effective way to strike the empathetic chord to suddenly transport someone who is clearly modern and oh, successful on, and uh, a mother, uh, a wife, a pillar of her community and snatch her from her modern life where she had complete dominion over her world, agency over her world, her life, her choices and deposit her in the haunted open air house of the antebellum south we're hoping that what people will garner or gain from the film at its conclusion when antebellum appears on the screen for the last time is the idea that the past as faulkner said is never dead it's not even past and so we need to have the courage as a society to confront the ugly truths of 
America's past in order for us to move forward uh, in a meaningful way where we don't continue to slide backward because um, we're not really confronting the truth truly. Well, thank you. Christopher, let me ask you a question, and, and I don't want to get too personal, but, you know, when, as I understand it, Gerard had this dream, and, and this woman was reaching out to him uh, in this dream. You were making coffee. He was telling you about it. Now, I often do that with my husband. My husband just said, you know, you're screwed up, buddy. But how did you guys <laughs> meld over this dream and, you know, sharing of this? How, wh what is the, the, the moment here where you felt that what Gerard had, had struck upon was going to become such a meaningful, social, socially consequential horror movie? I think halfway through him explaining uh, the, you know, the bullet points of, of the dream, what happened, taking me through it, I'm continuing to listen, but reach over for my laptop and bring it over to the couch. And when he was finished with making the coffee, I said, that's an outrageous and incredible story and terrifying and we have to write it today. And we wrote the short story that then turned into the script that day. You know, you you reached out to other filmmakers, um, you know, of Academy Award winning films, as I understand it, the makers of Get Out, of Black Klansman. Um, you know, I've had, you know, interviewed before uh, Barry Jenkins, who did Moonlight, for instance, you know, you know, all of these trying in very different ways, some comedy, you know, some uh, essentially tragedies. You know, looking at this, what insights did they give you about storytelling in, in uh, on these issues? Well, I mean, we had had spent the past decade focused on um, amplifying a host of really important issues as it relates to social justice and environmental justice and politics and voter suppression in America. And so for us, it was a natural, organic um, evolution and, a, and migration toward long form uh, storytelling in addressing these issues. When we completed the script for Antebellum, we were on the lookout for a producing partner. And we met with uh, Sean and Ray, Sean McKittrick and Ray Mansfield, who are uh, the producers of Black Klansmen, us, Get Out, um, really smart guys who we enjoyed a chemistry with that understood exactly what we were trying to say and how polarizing that it would in all likelihood prove to be. We needed and wanted the support of, of producers that understood we weren't looking to present a varnished, sugar-coated version of what we were trying to say. And we were really fortunate to have found like minds uh, to help us create um, Antebellum and all of the movies that, that will follow Antebellum. We hope to amplify these issues and use uh, cinema in a way that, that um, because we, we really respect the, the power of cinema and what it can do in delivering a message and shifting a collective consciousness. Um, we have to remember that yes, entertainment is important for entertainment's sake. And I think that there are plenty of, of filmmakers that do that and do it incredibly well. Uh, for Chris and I, we are, are looking to use cinema um, to amplify these issues and to catalyze a national dialogue around what we think are um, pressing, urgent uh, topics that we need to address and that can't be um, put off for another day. I'm going to try to ask you both this, and it's a little complicated for me because I'm not sure I'm going to get it right. You know, as I said earlier, I wing a lot of this. I'm just reacting in real time to what I'm hearing. Um, I've had two interviews recently that really blew me away. One was today, William, well, many of the interviews, but, but Reverend William Barber um, of Repairers mm -hmm. of the Breach, um, powerful. Uh, and recently in another thing I was doing, Dr. Cornell West. Both of them, without missing a beat, talked across a broader way of, of discrimination across the thing and said, you know, we need to have a fully inclusive LGBTQ. We need to have, uh, uh, you know, blacks, Hispanics, poor whites, others in this broad, you know, this message. And it's not something I had heard often, particularly from powerful black leaders. You know, oftentimes people talk about 
their, their community. Even in this show, we've had people talk about areas of concern that they were identified with. I'm interested, you know, you're, you're gay filmmakers, and, and you're touching you know, a, a, a very um, hard, consequential issue on racial discrimination and overcoming the legacy of this. And obviously, you're in the spirit in my book of Reverend Barber, of Cornell West, of others that are out there. But I'm interested in how the black community responds to you in response to that. Have, do, do, do they get it right away, or are there levels uh, of growth and evolution that they need to make as well as they think about these issues? Uh, because I don't think everyone comes pre-packed like what Reverend Barber did today. Well, you know, look, I think that that as a black American, as a proud black Texan, I, I recognize that um, our our evolution as a race in terms of of understanding the effective the effectiveness of self hate that has been dispatched and delivered um, since our kidnapping and being deposited in America and forced into labor, free labor, and, and have the original economics of this country built on the backs of our free stolen labor. And I think because of that, it can become incredibly complex when we start thinking about our rights as they relate to other marginalized groups. Uh, I'm really careful in the language that I use to refer to myself and to my community. I'm really proud um, to be, a, I'm a card carrying member of the LGBTQ community. Um, I've been with the same partner for, for 12 years. Christopher and I are also um, creative partners as well as life partners. So I, I have a tremendous pride for who I am and in recognizing that my blackness is also incredibly central to my identity. And so to segue back to your question, no, I think that, that, that the African-American community is still working through uh, expanding the tent and understanding that your brothers and sisters are a part of the LGBTQ community as well. And that, you know, if you look back at James Baldwin, for instance, who was mm. so courageously, authentically himself at a time where that was considered criminal, and he was one of the leading voices within the civil rights movement, and he was doing it, his art, his writing served as the primary vehicle for his activism. Today, our art, how we express ourselves artistically and that output is our form of activism. And, and I think that it is for us to have the courage to create and make art that disturbs people from this sleepwalk of complacency and this idea that while my rights are not guaranteed and, and you feel yours are, that in some way, yours are not at risk because mine are, if that makes sense. Mm. We are all in this together and we have to understand, and I appreciate yeah. um, uh, Dr. West and I, I appreciate uh, Reverend Barber speaking on it because we do need to look at this from a more holistic perspective. If we want to get there faster, we're going to get there together. I, that's a really powerful message, and I love the way you framed it. It's just been sitting with me since I talked to Cornell West. It hit me again today. It's hitting me talking to you guys. I just think it's important for us to get out of our own silos, you know, in some way. Chris, let me ask you, uh, um, we don't have much time. I wish we had an hour, a couple hours, you know, <laughs> to the film, you know. But, but, but I, I, I guess, how do I put this? You guys don't shy away from depicting pretty horrible violence. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, impactful. I've seen, you know, sections of, of, of the film. I'm going to watch the whole thing. But, but, but it's, it's, it's violent. Uh, it's a horror film. Uh, one of the lines in it is, oh, honey, sometimes what looks like anger is really just fear. I'm just interested in the art form because it, it, it's important. What you just said, the sleepwalk of complacency about these things. DC is a walking you know, zombie land of complacency about lots of issues. 
And so I'm fascinated by the device, um, Chris, of of what you think, how you chose this vehicle, this direction to go to wake people up. Um, and we're talking about it in a public policy um, thing right now, so obviously it's working. But, but tell us how you chose this pathway to illuminate these issues. How does Horde, how does depicting you know, violence and dealing with you know, anger in the way you did uh, work out? Well, yes, thank you for that question. First, we absolutely recommend the film be viewed as a whole. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes. That's, that's uh, to you know, really get what we're trying to say. But no, it was important to us to be truthful and and about the antebellum South. I mean, the name of the film is Antebellum, and we didn't want to show any romanticized version of what that was. We even went, you know, so far as to uh, obtain the lenses that were used to shoot Gone with the Wind, which, hmm. you know, did show the antebellum South in that romanticized way. And we turned that on his head and and wanted to make sure that it was um, shown in a more truthful, realistic way. I'd also like to add that I think that we're at this place, you know, if you look back in the 70s and 80s, Hollywood was accused of desensitizing the movie-going audience to violence. And now today, as a result of the advent of a lot of, of comic book films and, and really um, mm. relatively benign, big entertainment vehicles that don't, that distract from the reality of the world that we live in, that I think that the audiences have become really desensitized to, um, or they have been, they've been indoctrinated in this idea of theme park rides as films. And what I would say is that our film is not nearly as violent as what actually took place uh, in the antebellum South. Our film is also not nearly as violent as CNN nightly. I think mm. until we're able to confront the horrific truth of the reality of the past and how it continues to haunt our present, I would much prefer, I don't want anyone to be triggered. That's why we have rated R on the film so that you understand that you're mm. in entering it into an adult situation. But at the same time, I would prefer that you, that you be triggered and activated within the safety of your own home or a theater than to continue walking outside of your home and living in an open air shooting gallery because we have been unable to confront the truth of a thing. So for mm -hmm. us, we are only interested in depicting the truth, the unvarnished truth, although we film it hopefully in a really beautiful cinematic fashion. Um, and that is also a part, that's a part of the, the, the methodology and the design and that's by intention. Because when I look at Gone with the Wind, I see a really beautiful, effective piece of propaganda that was so persuasive that it persuaded an entire society of people in the antebellum South in believing in their nobility, in their noble past, to the point that you have uh, plantations that are used as wedding venues. Right. We had Lady Antebellum, the group, get in contact with us saying that it was, it was weighing on their hearts after learning about Antebellum and the film and the backlash mm. about the name Antebellum that people were not so familiar with. And it, it weighed so heavy on their hearts that they changed their name. Wow. So understand that we do have the power to change hearts and minds and that we must first bring the truth of the thing to the public as, mm. as uncomfortable as that may be because discomfort is the primary catalyst that, in, that, that motivates people to change. You don't keep your hand on a hot stove because it's comfortable. You move it because, because of the discomfort. And that's what we're looking to do. Well, Christopher Renz and George uh, Gerard Bush, I, filmmakers of Annie Bellum, I, I recommend people watch it in its whole. Watch it tonight, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, I'm really grateful. This has been a powerful day and, you know, from a lot of different directions. And, I, and I'm just grateful that you've helped us take this another direction. I think... Uh, Gerard, what you just shared about about our not knowing about some of these legacy issues, these terms, it's just it's just really important uh, to think these things through. So thanks for suspending some of my ignorance uh, on these fronts. So thank you so much for joining us. It was our pleasure, and thank you so much for having us. We're huge fans of the Hill and DC, and so we're we're well, honored that we were. Well, included. thank you. Thank well, you. maybe you woke a few a few of us up here today. Thanks, guys. Hopefully. I hope you come back thank soon. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Khalil Gibran Muhammad is professor of history, race, and public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, another, another one of my favorite places, director of the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, so one of my other friends who was down here, Ibram Max Kendi, is moving up to your town, so he's going to be up in Cambridge, and you know, you're going to have a, you know, a, an arena of this. But as we think about anti-racism, what do you think we, everyone needs to hear and understand as we struggle with these times? We struggle with the fact that I think, I think maybe um, there's enough awareness because of some of the tragedies of this past year that people are beginning to think differently. Uh, so maybe some of this is tilting in the right direction. But I'd like to get your dashboard, if you will, of how you see our, our racial challenges today. Sure. Well, Steve, it's great to be on. And let me just say that, uh, first of all, there are no quick fixes. Um, so even the framing of the question is, I think that people are aware now and uh, they're prepared to move forward, um, miss the fact that as as the two filmmakers uh, just commented on in, in the great film, and, and I've seen it, the full film myself, is that uh, these problems are so deeply rooted mm. and the propaganda of racism, the propaganda of white supremacy, um, not only happened a long time ago in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, uh, but it has been an ongoing project. It's not an accident that most Confederate monuments were built long after slavery into the 1960s and 70s and still haven't fallen. So the work of anti-racism today uh, first requires serious historical reckoning. It, it requires all Americans uh, to be taught a different history, starting with our youngest citizens. Mm -hmm. It requires uh, adults to not only do the kind of reading and work that Kendi talks about in his own work and, and why his book has been a bestseller, but also means that companies and organizations in the private sector and the nonprofit sector have to do some deeper reckoning with how their own companies have perpetuated systems that were meant to produce inequality, that were meant to have Black people bear the greatest burden or Mexican-Americans or, depending on context, other uh, Asian immigrant groups like Vietnamese or Filipinos, others uh, who are some of the lowest income Americans in this country. Professor, as you look around the country right now, um, I'm just interested because I don't know the answer to this. Do you see some communities beginning to do this? Do you see textbooks changing, curricula changing? Do you see some places where they're best and promising ways into um, what, what you've said is so important? I know it's uneven, but I'd love to hear who's getting it right. Yeah, I think that's really a great question to ask because we do want to take stock of, of the work that's happening. So what mostly exists right now is a number of people are writing amazing books for all ages. And so this is the kind of golden era of books that were written to correct the canon, um, the, the way that um, uh, the youngest books in our society, the animated characters on television, everywhere you look were dominated by white faces. Uh, a an, an activist named Marley Diaz, uh, who, who led an effort to put as many books with black and brown protagonists in schools in this country and elsewhere, um, said that she was motivated because as a young kid in school, she said all she was reading about was white boys and their dogs. And she mm. couldn't see herself reflected in that. So she's done something about it. And therefore, so many others are. Kendi himself has written a, literally an anti-racist baby book, a, a simple picture book. So I do want to say that once we see this explosion of cultural products come into the world, it's incumbent upon parents and teachers to actually use the material. And that's going to take a bit more work, but I think there's a lot of possibility for change. So let me um, go to it. You sit in one of the most powerful educational institutions in the world, one of the richest institutions uh, in the world. Um, you know, everybody tries it. I was very taken with how you define it in the moment. You know, I've been sitting here wondering, do the protests of the George Floyd murder and, you know, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, all of these things, which are really the tip of the iceberg. I have friends you know, clearly who've been been uh, stopped by police, harassed by police, have known people killed, uh, uh, and those didn't get protests. So I worry that this moment will just dissipate into nothing once we do this. So I, I get what you're saying, but do your colleagues at Harvard get it? 
<laughs> that sounds like a setup. No, it's not. <laughs> so, it's an yeah. honest question. <laughs> so, yeah, so Harvard is a big place, uh, both yeah. um, in terms of uh, its history. It's the oldest yeah. university in the country. Uh, it, uh, it has an outsized influence um, in higher education and indeed in the world. Um, and of course, it has some incredibly smart people. So to answer your question, um, I think that a lot of people at Harvard get it. The students get it. A lot of faculty get it. But what Harvard hasn't gotten institutionally is Harvard hasn't made the deep investments in teaching the history of race and racism um, across its university curricula that would have prepared generations of leaders leading up to this moment to actually lead in an anti-racist way. And so that's not to say that Harvard is a bastion of racism. It is to say, and I'll use a, a Kendi formulation here, I think it's useful as this moment, mm. Harvard imagined itself as not being racist. And so uh, a lot of racism just swirled around. I think it's also important to say that uh, places like Harvard and other institutions of higher education have been explaining away racial disparities for a very long time, often by blaming low-income, poor people of color, black and brown people especially, essentially for making bad decisions. And they've invested a lot of research um, to explain that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's sort of like saying, we're going to talk about broken people rather than broken systems. You know, I'm just looking at, you know, the, the, reminding myself, you're, you're, you know, with the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project, the accountability part is one that I think is fascinating. We heard, you know, something I hadn't heard when it's actually one of our underwriters for today. The National Association of Realtors very bluntly said, you know, we were awful. We did terrible things. We blocked people from building wealth and assets. We're, we're sorry we did. You know, it's a pretty, pretty bold statement. Georgetown University says, you know what? We benefited from slave trade. We benefit from that. We have to create a new uh, we have to deal with that publicly and come around. There's lots of places where there's not accountability. What are, the, what are the mechanisms of accountability that you think are healthy, not just for past behavior, but just ongoing, unconscious, the way we do things behavior, which is producing such a divided result in the country? Yeah, well, well accountability starts with honesty, uh, with truth. And this isn't just an abstraction. This is the very thing that uh, we've lacked in our political culture over the past four years. This is the thing that we socialize young people to. We want our children to tell the truth. We want our teachers to encourage young people to tell the truth. And so we haven't been honest about the past. We haven't been honest about why we have so much inequality in the United States relative to other liberal democracies. And so the point of accountability is, is um, not just about personal reflection, it is also about institutional reflection. Um, these pasts are yesterday, not a decade ago, not a hundred years ago. And so whether it's a, a, a for-profit company or a nonprofit entity looking around and saying, gee, you know, all the decision makers are mostly white men or white men with a sprinkling of white women, or maybe a South Asian here uh, or there, or an East Asian here or there, you know, these are all intentional choices. So the honesty starts and the accountability starts with saying, um, we're missing something here. We haven't been questioning our own assumptions. And if you can do that, then you can build metrics around why it is that you uh, look the way you did in the past and what you want from the future. I can tell you anecdotally, because it's hard to audit private sector companies, but uh, when you talk to some of the leadership uh, off the record, people will say that, uh, HR buries the data that would be required oftentimes to actually be proactive about the pipeline of entry level diversity numbers compared to uh, senior level positions. And that's just about representation and personnel. That says nothing about the business model itself and whether it's healthy uh, for our society. This is going to sound silly, but I, I don't mean it in a silly way. Um, I know that you do uh, documentaries, you've been in, you know, you talk uh, to the media, but how do we scale you? How do we find voices like yourself? As I think part of this in finding the knack to help people feel comfortable trying to be honest with their past, what they've done, finding pathways, is going to require a lot more folks doing what you're doing. So um, I, I guess, how do, we, how do we scale your message? I know it, I, and I don't mean it in a silly way because I think it's very important. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. So I won't take it as flattery. I'll take it as uh, we have increased demand 
and the perception of a supply problem because it's right. a kind of a, a new moment of, of awakening and there's a scramble for saying, okay, we want to move forward and we know we need help. I think that's a really good question and a fair question. But oftentimes, um, it's not a function of supply. There are a lot of talented people, both in the academy who work like I do. So, you know, some, some of us work off campus, quote unquote. Um, but there are also people who are in industry who've been doing this work for a long time. And uh, they just need to be activated. They need to be able to look decision makers in the eye and say, I don't want to waste your time and almost certainly don't, don't want to waste my time if you're not serious about this work. Um, the problem for this work has not been that there aren't talented people to help companies or organizations, whether it's higher education, you name it, churches, community organizations, to, to, do, to be better and to do better and to be anti-racist. The problem isn't that there isn't help out there. The problem is that when people were delivering the help, they were being um, ignored in terms of what they uh, suggested. Their suggestions were not taken. Their recommendations were passed over. The incremental baby step was the, what people wanted and not something transformative. So people who do this work need to know that there is a serious commitment to it. Well, listen, we're, we're out of time, regrettably, but I just want to say it's such a pleasure to um, talk to you and hear from you. You know, our entire team at The Hill, when we were thinking about programs we do, was very committed uh, to, this, to this program. And the voices that we brought on, anchored by you today here uh, in the final thing, has been very important. So Khalil uh, Jabran Muhammad, Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, Director of the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project. I hope we can continue this and so I can ask my silly questions because I love listening to your solid answers. So uh, thank you so Thanks much so for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our program for today. A very big thank you to Qualcomm, the International Franchise Association, and the National Association of Realtors for their support and to all of you in the audience for joining us. For those of you who missed any of the conversations this afternoon, we'll have a video up of the full event and it's gonna be worth watching. These were great, great sessions. I'm gonna relive it all myself. Uh, go watch them. I'm Steve Clemens. Thank you for joining us for our Diversity and Inclusion Summit. Be well.